Acts 18, our text today will be 12 to 22. And uh, I'll, I'll begin reading at verse 1. And uh, we're, we're going to finish the second missionary journey today. And uh, toward the end of this section, Luke's kind of tying up some loose ends. So he covers a lot of uh, material quickly. But it's definitely worth looking at. So let me begin uh, reading at verse 1. And after these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born at Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Pris Priscilla, because Claudius had demanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So because it was of the same trade, he worked with them and stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. <clears throat> and Christmas, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and a, six months, teaching the word of God among them. And here's the beginning of our text. And oh, by the way, the topic of our sermon is Paul, Paul before Gallio. Paul before Gallio. And then we'll tie up some loose ends. When Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing of wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names in your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. In other words, he ignored it. So Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria. And Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Chancrea, for he had taken a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. I'll go ahead and read 23. And he had spent time there, and he departed and went over to the region of Gal Galatia and Phrygia in order of strengthening all the disciples. Ascendeth the reading of God's holy word. <clears throat> he went up to Jerusalem. He went down to Antioch. They don't talk about going up and going down in terms of north and south, as we often do, but they do it in terms of elevation. In our last study, we saw that Jesus came to Paul in a vision and promised him that he would be protected from harm at Corinth. The promise is one of temporal, physical protection. For we know that Paul will be uh, executed by the state under Nero in about 14 years from this point. The promise does not mean that Paul would face no opposition or verbal attacks, but that he would not suffer physical coercion or beatings or stonings or stabbings. He's not going to be thrown in a dungeon. He's not going to be beat up. He's going to be protected physically from harm. Keep preaching, Paul. Don't worry. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to make sure that nothing happens to you. And that's the context of uh, Paul before Gallio today that you need to know. In verses 12 to 17, we see the historical outworking of, of this promise of protection. Now, the unbelieving Jews still hate Paul, and they hate him with a passion. <clears throat> and they hate the gospel. And like the other examples we've seen in the book of Acts, they seek the Roman state's 
coercion to stamp out the gospel. They want the state's coercion against Paul, but their attempts at physical persecution will backfire against them. And once again, we see this in light of the promise made to Paul by Christ. Christ was with Paul and was concerned with gathering in the elect in Corinth. And the surrounding area had a very, uh, had a very different result here than in Thessalonica. And there are a number of things about the narrative that merit our attention. First, <clears throat> we see that the Jews who did not believe, the unbelieving Jews, the apostate Jews, we could call them, are now fully organized against Paul. And with one accord, the text tells us, they bring Paul before Gallio's judgment seat. They're organized. The Jews left in the synagogue stood unanimous against Paul, Christ, and the gospel. And the, the Greek indicates that this, was, this opposition was premeditated and it was systematic, it was fully organized. The elect Jews have left the synagogue and joined the Christian church. <clears throat> and those left in the synagogue are apostates who are dedicated to stamping out Christianity. And of course, Paul's the chief preacher to the Gentiles, and they want to stamp out Paul. Uh, Paul. The gospel separates the chief from the goats in history. And of course, Satan's children do not agree to disagree. They eventually always seek physical coercion against the true covenant people. Now, throughout church history, Satan has always had two tactics against the church. One is coercion, persecution. Both privately and by the Molech state. And then the other tactic has been syncretism, where false teachers enter in to destroy the church from within. And he's doing both in this first generation. Paul is going to go to Jerusalem, fulfill his vow, and he's going to go back to Antioch in Syria, his home church, his home base. And scholars believe that's where he wrote the book of Galatians, right before the third missionary journey. Galatians is a very early epistle. And he wrote the book of Galatians because after Paul left the churches in Galatia, the Judaizers moved in and started teaching false doctrine. So Satan tries every tactic he can. Historically, heresy and superstition... And syncretism with paganism has caused much more damage to the church than physical persecution. <clears throat> In God's providence, the Jews take Paul before Gallio, who saw what they were attempting to do. He saw through what they were doing, and he refused to throw Paul in prison and give him a beating. Now, Gallio is the elder brother of Seneca, a Stoic thinker, a famous philosopher, and moralist. Very well known. Seneca was Nero's tutor when Nero was young, an uncle of Luke and the famous poet. He was born in Cordoba, Spain, and his full name was Marcus Ananias Novatius. Novatius, Novatius. When he moved to Rome, he was adopted by Lucius Junius Gallio and thus assumed his name. He entered the civil government and served as a, a praetor for about five years. He went to Achaia to serve as a proconsul and eventually attained the rank of consul. Now, scholars and historians tell us that he served as proconsul from either July 51 to June 52. And some say he served from A.D. 52 to 53. It's either one or the other. We know that Luke's account is accurate from inscriptions found at Delphi, which say that in the 12th year of Claudius, Gallio was the proconsul of Achaia. So we have uh, the total accuracy of Luke noted. Here's what J.A. Alexander says. Here again, Luke's accuracy, even in minute points, is remarkable. One historian, Dio Cassius, says that Achaia was the first, first in imperial province and then therefore governed by proconsuls. Suetonius records this, uh, end of quote. Suetonius records this region's restoration to the emperor after a rebellion before the time of these events so that the nomenclature of the narrative is perfectly correct. 
perfect accuracy in historical details. The Bible is the Word of God. It's inspired. It's true, not only in doctrine, not only in worship, not only in theology, but also in history, but also in geography, but also in science. Now, this helps us narrow down Paul's ministry in Corinth to sometime between 50 and 53. Most commentators say he was probably there in 51 and 52. Now, Gallio was known by his contemporaries as a reasonable man of culture and refinement. He was probably chosen as a proconsul because of his fairness. Seneca says that his brother Gallio was an intelligent man who hated flattery and was blessed with a, quote, unaffectionately pleasant personality, end of quote. And then, sadly, uh, Seneca will fall out of favor with Nero, who is crazy. Nero was a maniac. He, he was actually nicknamed the Beast by his contemporaries and uh, committed bestiality and homosexuality and all sorts of things. Um, he was a psychopath, and he forced Seneca to commit suicide. And then, according to historians, a, a short time later, he had Gallio killed as well. Second, Luke notes the Jews' accusations against Paul. This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. Not contrary to the law of Rome, contrary to the law of Moses. The Jews, that is the religious leaders and perhaps other prominent Jews of wealth and influence, brought Paul before the council, the court. It seems that Paul came voluntarily so that he could offer a defense before Gallio. And it could be that the Jews were deliberately using the term law in an ambiguous manner, so the term law also applied to Roman law, but it's unlikely, given Gallio's answer. Gallio certainly didn't take it that way. Remember, the unbelieving Jews had two problems with the Christians regarding the law of Moses. What were they? Well, number one, they believed that keeping the law and attaining a certain level of personal righteousness was necessary before a person could be declared righteous by God in the heavenly court. We call this the doctrine of justification. For the Jews, like the Roman Catholics, you need God's grace, but you need to add on to that human works. And then if you get righteous to a certain point, you'll be declared righteous. The Christian position is that we are justified solely by the sacrificial death of Christ that removes the guilt of our sin, all the guilt's removed, that record of guilt you have. And, of course, the righteousness of Christ, his perfect obedience to the law, or keeping of the covenant of works in full, is reckoned to your account. It's imputed to your account. So when God looks upon you, he doesn't see your life of sin and uh, completely falling short of what God requires, but he sees the perfection of Christ. And Christ dealt with this, of course, in the parable of the wedding feast, um, where those without the wedding garments are cast into hell. And the wedding garments represent the robes of Christ's perfect righteousness. <clears throat> we lay hold of what he has achieved, his perfect salvation by faith alone, not by the works of the law. Now, does this mean that Christians can go out and sin all they want because Christ did it all? And the answer is no, of course not. Not at all. Believers are required to be holy and faithful to the, to the covenant. But their holiness is always a fruit of justification. It's never a part or element of justification. It's never a means of attaining justification. It's always a result of justification. You say, well, that's a pretty sharp distinction. Well, it's a crucial distinction between it because it's the one between Protestantism and Roman Catholicism. It's a distinction between going to heaven or going to hell. Christ gets all the glory, you get none of it. Yes, you're required to be holy. In Hebrews, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Is that saying that you have to attain a certain amount of holiness before you're saved? No, that's not what it says. It's simply what's taught by James in, 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 in the epistle to James. Faith without works is dead. If you don't have good works, if you don't have holiness, if you don't have obedience, habitual obedience to Christ, then clearly you don't have real faith. 
Justification is always accompanied by sanctification. Westminster Standards teach correctly that the justification is always accompanied by sanctification and all the other saving graces. Romanism, Roman Catholicism, the Federal Vision, the disciples of John Piper, and of course Piper used to teach something very similar to the Federal Vision. His disciples are still teaching it. I don't know if he holds to it still or not. And neonomianism mingle the doctrine of justification with sanctification. <clears throat> and that's deadly. That's deadly. For the moment you bring in your sin-stained works into the picture, uh, you can't be justified by that. Christ receives all the glory. And if you don't give Christ all the glory, you're not a Christian. It's that simple. Jesus said our righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, who had a very external view of God's law, and who overturned many commandments that were moral and crucial by their human traditions. But personal holiness has absolutely nothing to do with our justification before God. Nothing. Godliness and personal obedience to the moral law is evidence that our faith in Christ is genuine. You say, well, man, you've told us this a hundred times. Well, discussion groups on the Internet, there's still Reformed people that are purportedly Reformed on there that are saying things that are totally heretical because they're ignorant. You're not justified by your holiness. It has nothing to do with your justification. And Paul says in uh, Philippians chapter 3 that he had to regard all of this righteousness as a pile of stinking excrement in God's sight, to lay hold of Christ and his righteousness. And Luther called, we need an alien righteousness. It's not our own. It belongs to Christ. Personal righteousness has nothing to do with justification at all. Is it necessary to be a Christian, uh, to live as a Christian? Yes, it is. That's sanctification. But it's not justification. So let's make that clear. Number two. So that's one problem of the Jews. And they still teach that heresy today. And they actually have a thing in the Talmud uh, that talks about the scales in the Day of Judgment. And God's going to take your evil deeds and put it on this side of the scales and your good works and put it on this side of the scales. And if your good works outweigh your evil deeds, you get to go to heaven. That's in the Talmud. Absolutely heretical. Good works don't eliminate sin. Number two. Christians are not required to keep the ceremonial ordinances such as circumcision and the Jewish feast days. To unbelieving Jews, the unbelieving Jews believe that the Gentiles could only gain eternal life by first becoming a full Jew. You become a proselyte, then you get circumcised, then you follow all these rituals, and you have to follow the ceremonial laws to a T, and then after a period of time, you get to become basically a Jew. So you can only be justified by becoming a Jew and following the whole law of Moses. That Gentiles could go directly to God through Jesus Christ without the long process of becoming a Jewish proselyte greatly angered the Jews. Keep in mind the Jews were a bunch of racists. You know, we're the Jews. We're great. We're God's covenant people. They despise the Gentiles. Now they allowed Gentiles into the faith through this long process. And they, it was anathema to them that you could simply believe in Christ and be baptized in your part of the church. They hated that. Then third, Gallio gives a very strong rejection of the Jews' charges, and he does so quickly and emphatically. He does it so quickly and emphatically that Paul doesn't even have an opportunity to respond. He, he wanted to give an offense. He doesn't even have an opportunity to even speak. In verses 14 to uh, 16, we read, And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names in your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. And the Jews here are dealing with a Roman proconsul, not a, le a lower level politician like in Thessalonica. Pro-council is a big shot. 
They know Gallio too well to attempt to accuse Paul of treason, like in Thessalonica, so they accuse Paul of being a corrupter of the Jewish religion. That's what they're saying. He's corrupting our religion. He's teaching heresy. Now, they could have accused Paul of making converts of Roman citizens, which was against the law, but that was a problem for A, they attempted to do the same thing, and B, no Christian Roman um, would, could serve as a, uh, would serve as a witness against Paul. You need, wit you need witnesses. They imply that Paul is doing something devious by the word uh, for pers uh, persuasion, they use which means to stir up by per persuasion. To, to, Paul's stirring things up in our community. That's, that's the, the word persuasion they use. Now, Paul is about to present his defense on his side of the situation, but Gallio cuts in and he ends the whole matter immediately because he finds the Jewish argument not applicable and foolish. The interruption is not out of disrespect for Paul, for the decision is in Paul's favor. We clearly get the impression that Gallio was annoyed with the Jews for bothering him about something he thinks does not rise to the level of even needing a court hearing. What are you doing bringing this to me? So here's Gallo's argument. It's as follows. Number one, he points out that if Paul was guilty of some serious misdeed or crime, he would be justified in accepting and acting on their complaint. But they have not brought up such matters. Gallio essentially says, if you were speaking of theft or fraud or rape or murder or assault, that is things that are actually crimes, I would be bound to consider your complaint. So the Jews were foolish to think that a Roman judge would side with them in a Jewish religious matter. Now remember back in Thessalonica, uh, there, were, there were prominent Jews who had connections with these lesser civil magistrates and they caused problems for Paul, but that's not the case here. This guy doesn't really care what the Jews have to say. And then number two, he points out that it is not his job to get into questions of Jewish theology or law. The terms used are noteworthy words that indicates differences of theological definition. I don't care what you think theologically. That's your thing. It's not my thing. I'm not a Jew. The term names probably refers to whether Jesus of Nazareth should be called Messiah or Savior. I don't care what you think about Jesus. That's, that's not my matter. Your own law refers to the law of Moses and probably the scribal editions or traditions as well. The Jews, Gallio knew, had all sorts of theological debates and they split hairs over words and names. And Gallio says, I don't want any part of this. This is not my job. And then three, he tells them uh, very sharply uh, to deal with these questions uh, among themselves, and he says he will not be a judge of such matters. He basically says, look, I'm here to deal with crimes, not re with religious disputes or contentions. Get out. Get out of my court. He kicked them out. Gallio's statement contains an element of scorn and disdain. So, like I said, this whole thing's backfiring, and we have to look at this in the context of Jesus' promise to protect Paul. Now, Gallio must be commended in this situation for recognizing that as a civil magistrate, his job was to deal with real criminal matters. In addition... And by the way, the law, the law of Moses is really helpful in this regard because the law of Moses uh, sharply defines and makes a difference between sins that are simply sins and sins that rise to the level as civil crimes. Okay, it's, not a, it's not a crime to lust in your heart. It's a sin, but it's not a crime. If you tell a lie to somebody, it's not a crime unless you're committing fraud or breaking a contract. So the Bible makes distinctions here, and he's, he's pretty sharp. In addition, he showed wisdom in not entering into a dispute of which he knew nothing about. In a Christian nation, the magistrate has authority to deal with civil laws related to the first table of the law. That is true. 
public idolatry, enticement to worship a false god or religion, sorcery, witchcraft, blasphemy, etc. Pagan civil magistrates should avoid matters of religion as much as possible. Because if they do make civil laws on such matters, we know that they'll be unbiblical and they're going to end up persecuting Christians. Why is that? Well, Paul says they suppress the truth and unrighteousness in Romans chapter 1, 18 and following, and they create idols. So uh, uh, natural law is not going to do it for heathen. They're always going to create idols and they're always going to persecute Christians. So it's good for them just to avoid religious matters altogether if they're not Christians. If you're a Christian, you have an obligation to obey the moral law and enforce the moral law. Gallio had contempt for these wicked Jews who wanted to use the state to persecute Paul. Therefore, he spoke harshly to them, and he asked his lictor, this police, his local policeman here, to clear the court. We must note this incident, of course, in the context of Jesus' promise to protect Paul from violence in Corinth. So the resurrected Savior put Gallo, Gallio in that position, and Gallio protected Paul. Okay, so sometimes God delivers you through an immediate work of the Holy Spirit. And then sometimes, very often, he uses secondary agencies for the protection of Christians. The sovereign purposes of Christ can be seen in Luke's epilogue to this narrative. In verse 17 we read, Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. Okay, Gallio was there. He saw this happening. <laughs> there were police there. There were lictors there. They could have put a stop to it immediately. And he didn't. Now, Sosthenes was the new leader of the synagogue. And he had replaced Crispus, who became a Christian. We looked at that last week. Crispus became a Christian. He left the synagogue to attend the Christian church. As the leader of the synagogue, he would have been the chief spokesman in an attempt to persecute Paul. That's why the people pick on him and beat him. He was the chief spokesman, bringing these accusations. The judgment seat and the proceedings would take place outside in view of the public who could watch and listen. They had an area where the court met and then uh, people were allowed to gather around the separated area to watch. The judgment seat was literally a seat that they would take and set over here. So the, judgment, the people could watch and they could listen to what was going on. These Gentiles did not care for the Jews, and they took offense at the absurd and unjust attack on Paul. They attacked and beat Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, who was the main speaker against Paul. And the verb beat, as in beat him, is in the imperfect tense and indicates a lengthy beating. <laughs> he, got the, he got beat up real good, the leader of the synagogue. So the whole thing backfired. What he wanted the state to do to Paul happened to him. And in the Mosaic Law, when you bring a false accusation against somebody, and it's proved that you bring a false accusation, according to the Mosaic Law, uh, what you wanted to be done to him has to be done to you, if you're a false witness. And was he a false witness? Yes, he was. Now, did the, did the Greeks, the Gentiles, know that, what they were, that they were fulfilling the Mosaic Law here? No, they did not. They were just angry. But in God's justice, Sosthenes gets a good solid beating. Christ not only protected Paul, as he promised, to the point where Paul did not even need to make a defense. He didn't even have to open his mouth. But Jesus also providentially had the mob beat the persecutor so the false accuser received what he wanted to happen to Paul. And this beating took in took place in the full view of Gallio and the tribunal, and no police or soldiers were told to intervene on behalf of Sosthenes. Let him have what he deserves. The Jews who sought to persecute Paul, these Jews, 
and force him out of the whole region were emphatically and strongly stopped by Jesus Christ. They knew that they did not have the state or the people on their side. They now knew that to oppose Paul was a mistake that backfired on them and caused a backlash. Gallio and the police looked the other way, while Sosthenes got the beating he so richly deserved. Now, I'm not saying that unbelievers should get beatings like this, unless it's approved by a court in a lawful way. So I'm not, you know, I'm not saying mob violence is a good thing, but God can use such things for his purposes. Now, there's a man named Sosthenes who was a Christian and is, uh, was named by Paul in 1 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. So you got a man named Sosthenes who's a Christian in Corinth. This fact causes a lot of the older commentators to argue that the Gentile mob beat Sosthenes the Christian because they were angry at Paul and they wanted to beat up Paul's friend. In other words, they were angry that Paul didn't get persecuted. But the text makes it clear that at the time of the beating, he was the leader of the synagogue. So he couldn't have been a Christian. If this Sosthenes is the same man named as a beloved Christian, 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, it means that at some subsequent time, this enemy of Paul converted to Christ and became a solid Christian. Which is highly possible. Now what's the lesson here? Well, once again, Note Christ's sovereign power to protect his saints from harm. Christ is king. Christ is present with us. And he is fully capable of helping us in times of need and persecution. So are we supposed to worry and get all upset and fret and cry and act all upset about matters? No. You trust in Christ and what do you do? If you're concerned, you pray. Don't get upset. Christ will protect you. Verse 18 records Paul's departure from Corinth with some interesting historical details. So Paul re still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria. And Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Chancrea for he had taken a vow. Now we know there were, either at this time or later, there was a church in Sancria, which is a suburb, it's really a suburb of Corinth. Paul arrived in Corinth, in Sancria, many days after the incident. Uh, he, well, he arrived in Corinth many days, uh, remained in Corinth many days after the incident before Gallio. And this would be a part of the year and a half that's mentioned earlier in the text. Paul knew that the Roman civil authorities would protect him in Corinth and thus had an extended stay to gather in the elect as Jesus had told him to do. Take courage, I'm with you, don't worry. I have many people in the city, I need you to stay here and gather in the elect. So Paul departs in around AD 52 or 53. Luke tells us that he took leave of the brethren. He said goodbye to all the converts who made up the infant church in Corinth. And this would have, been, would have been with much affection, various exhortation and prayers, as we'll see later on when he leaves uh, the elders at Ephesus. There would also be cautions and warnings regarding false teachers, such as the Judaizers and various antinomians. When Paul was in Chidencrea, a harbor town a few miles east of Corinth, which is considered by some to be part of Corinth, or it's really a suburb, by the time uh, Paul wrote the book of Romans, this town would have a Christian church probably planted from Corinth. That's where uh, Phoebe the deaconess, uh, a helper of Paul, came from, Romans 16. So Paul cuts his hair to fulfill a vow. Now Luke does not tell us what kind of vow. They don't tell us what kind of vow Paul had taken or why he took the vow or when he took the vow. We're not given any details. But most scholars believe that this was some kind of Nazarite vow because it involved the cutting of a hair and was a preparation for his eventual visit to Jerusalem. You're supposed to cut your hair 
30 days in advance of a ritual that you perform in Jerusalem. Uh, generally, it was done in Jerusalem, so, but we don't know the details. The Nazarite was supposed to shave his consecrated head at the temple or at Jerusalem, but with a dispor of the Jews, this requirement became, uh, decentralization was, was permitted by the Jews. The hair would be cut and then taken to Jerusalem and then burned there. It is likely that Paul was fulfilling a vow taken before his conversion to Christ. And keep in mind also that although uh, Paul knew that the ceremonial law was no longer binding, he would keep various ceremonial laws to the purpose of reaching the Jews with the gospel. And of course the Jews had great respect for uh, Nazarites. Great, great respect for Nazarites. Although Paul vigorously defended our liberty from the shadow ordinances of the ceremonial law, he conformed himself in various respects to the shadow ceremonies for the sake of his own people. Here's what Matthew Henry says. <clears throat> I see no harm in admitting it, the vow concerning Paul, for concerning him we must admit the same thing. And he says, look at chapter 21, 24, and 26. Not only in compliance for a time with the Jews to become as a Jew, 1 Corinthians 9, 20, that he might win them uh, more, but also be because of the vow of the Nazarites, though, ceremon though ceremonial and as such ready to vanish away, yet had a great deal of moral and various pious significance and therefore was fit to die the last of all the Jewish ceremonies. The Nazarites are joined with the prophets, Amos 2.11, and were very much the glory of Israel, Lamentations 4.7. And there, therefore, <coughs> it is not strange if Paul bound himself for some time with the vow of his Nazarite from wine and strong drink and for being trimmed to recommend himself to the Jews, and from this he must now discharge himself. Very good. Now Paul took Aquila and Priscilla with him, on the first leg of the journey. And this is noted for they will be of great assistance in Ephesus. He's going to leave them in Ephesus. He's going to go on to Caesarea and then go up to Jerusalem. And then after he fulfills his vow, he's going to travel from Jerusalem up to Antioch and Syria. He went to Antioch and Syria, his hometown, but he first stopped in Ephesus, the more, most important city in all of Asia Minor. And then we have a brief note of him in Ephesus. Now keep in mind, he's on his way to Jerusalem. He's just stopping there, briefly. From the port of Chancrea, the ship sailed across the Aegean Sea to Ephesus. Ephesus is across the sea, almost due east from Athens. And the voyage to Ephesus from Athens would have taken two to three days, depending on the south winds. It is on the west coast of Asia Minor, modern Turkey, south of Smyrna and Sardis, and directly west of Laodicea. It was a little uh, inland uh, uh, on the mouth of the Castor River. The city was founded by Ionian, that is, Greek colonists from Athens. And there was a very large harbor at Ephesus, and Ephesus, before the days of Paul, was the greatest trading center on the west coast of Asia Minor. And because it was a river, it had to be dredged, it had to be upkept. Up Today, due to deforestation and silt, Ephesus, ancient Ephesus, is seven miles inland. It's seven miles away from the sea. And the word Ephesus simply means the landing place. That's where ships would go. Even by Paul's day, silt was a problem, and Domitian, at the end of the first century AD, attempted to repair the harbor. Ephesus was a major commercial center and capital of the Roman province of Asia. After Corinth, it was the next great city on the main road from Rome to the east. It was at a crucial location in that four large roads, main roads, diverged in different directions from that city. So it's totally crucial. Ephesus is crucial to Western Asia Minor. It was on the same valley, it was in the same valley, the Lycus Valley, with Laodicea, Colossae, and Hierapolis, all of which had churches, eventually. The seven churches mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3 were lo uh, likely established during this period of apostolic activity, but not all were established directly by Paul. Uh, most of, uh, here's, here's, here's Asia Minor, and then you got Ephesus over here, and then you go, you got the seven churches of Revelation are right, right up in here, right, really close to Ephesus. They're not that far from Ephesus. 
It had a very large population of Greeks, being from uh, a former Greek colony. It also had also a large population of uh, Asiatics, who were very dedicated to paganism, which chiefly involved the worship of the goddess Artemis. Artemis, a fertility cult. Uh, for some reason, English Bibles like to call her Diana, but if you look at the Greek word, it says Artemis. She's called Diana of the Ephesians, but she's Artemis. And the, the, same, the same as Ashtart, a pagan deity. The temple stood a little distance outside the city, near the slope of a hill, and was the religious center of the whole district. The statue and temple were so great. Uh, there's a, there was a giant statue of Diana, and if you've ever, you can, there's reproductions of this in, in, in encyclopedias. And it looks like she's got like four or five rows of breasts that go all around her body. You know, th those are eggs. She was a fertility cult. And that's why Easter is associated uh, in your old uh, Easter, which comes from the word Ashtart. Uh, that's why Easter eggs are part of, uh, part of that uh, pagan tradition. The temple and the statue were so great and beautiful that it served as a tourist attraction in the days of Paul. To, uh, thousands and thousands of pilgrims would have came from all over yearly to celebrate the Feast of Artemis. And there was a huge uh, tourist industry where they made little statues to, that were sold to the people. And Paul's going to get in trouble with these <laughs> tradesmen later on. They're going to go after Paul. And Paul, Ephesus was called the Temple Warden of Artemis. Now, Silas and Timothy are not mentioned in this narrative. It is likely that they stayed behind in Corinth and had no need or interest in going to Jerusalem with Paul. <clears throat> On arriving in the city, Aquila and Priscilla set up their business and probably purchased a home. They hosted a congregation in their home, and they sent their gre uh, greetings back to their Corinthian friends in Paul's first epistle, 1 Corinthians 16, 19. Most scholars believe that they were, they were kind of wealthy. Uh, and this afforded them the ability to go to another city, purchase, purchase a nice home, and just get their business going. And tents were needed all over the ancient world, and uh, it would be easy to set up a tent business. Jews lived in Ephesus in great numbers. Paul will follow his usual pattern of seeking out the Jews at the synagogue. Paul's stay at Ephesus on the way to Antioch, Syria, and Jerusalem is very brief, very brief. Some Jews at the synagogue wanted him to stay longer, but he needed to leave to fulfill his vows. And Ephesus will be picked up again in chapter 19 on his return trip, which is part of Paul's third missionary journey. Scholars believe that chapter 9 takes place about six months after Paul's uh, first visit to Ephesus. So you get the second missionary journey comes to an end. He goes to Jerusalem. He goes back to Antioch. He's in Antioch for some weeks, up to six months. Then he goes to, through Galatia and ends up back in Ephesus eventually. Paul had originally wanted to go to the Roman province of Asia much earlier, but was prohibited by the Holy Spirit in order to concentrate on Macedonia. Now that churches were established in Greek Asia, uh, in Greece, uh, Asia was opened up to him, and he wanted Ephesus to become his new, next major base of operations. And if you look at a good map of Asia Minor, modern Turkey, and you see where Ephesus is, and it's, on, it's right in the middle of four major roads. Uh, there's all these churches, you know, you've got Colossian and the seven churches of Revelation. They're all right near Ephesus. So it was a great, great operation. This makes sense due to the, its size and its central location at the crossroads of a number of important cities. This first visit to Ephesus is very brief and is important for the narration that follows and our introduction to Apollos, which will come back in chapter 19. But let us consider uh, the end of the second missionary journey, which is the rest of uh, some verses in chapter 18. First, as was his practice, after he arrives, he entered the synagogue and he reasoned with the Jews. We note the Jews in Ephesus were numerous and important. Though he had... Uh, He, abandoned, he had abandoned the unbelieving Jews in Corinth and proclaimed a curse upon them for rejecting Christ after repeated gospel sermons. He still made the first offer in Ephesus in obedience to Jesus. Always to the Jews first, then to the Greeks. Now Luke's account is extremely brief. brief. If you look at the last part of chapter 18, it's very fragmented. It's just little bits 
to fill in until the third missionary journey. So you've got all these things happening very quickly. Does not go into the usual details about people believing and, or people rejecting the gospel. We do know that Paul had success due to the various Jews asking him to stay. Stay. Teach us. We want to know more. Uh, they want to know more about Jesus Christ. These Jews were acting much better than the unbelieving Jews at Corinth. Paul did leave Aquila and Priscilla there to provide a place to meet and to give private counsel to the new believers to keep them uh, things decent and in order during his absence. So he did leave knowledgeable Aquila and Priscilla there uh, to help out until he could come back. They were knowledgeable, intelligent, and useful Christians, and thus could be of great service to the apostle, even though they were not church officers. There's no indication that they were church, well, the, you know, the wife obviously couldn't be, uh, but there's no indication that he was uh, any kind of a church officer, the husband. Note how Paul commends them for their service in Romans 16, 3 to 4. Greet Priscilla, and this is written many years later, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom I not only give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. They were so well versed in doctrine, they were able to instruct the great preacher Apollos. And they risked their lives for Paul, and all the churches of the Gentiles knew of their valiant efforts, uh, and with Paul were very thankful for their ministry. This is excellent proof that all Christians can and should be knowledgeable and should be happy and willing to do things for Christ. The idea that everything must be done by a professional ministerial class not only weakens the church, but it gives church members the false impression that nothing is expected from them except to show up for church. I'll never forget many, many years ago, uh, like 23 years ago or so, I show up in Lansing, Michigan to start a church, and there was, a, there was only one couple there. It was really a dumb place to start a church when you only had one couple, but one family. And they basically said, well, have fun. Go plant a church, have fun, good luck. You know, uh, come on. If, if you want the church to grow, everybody in the church has to be actively doing things, actively talking to people, actively witnessing to people. Everybody needs to know doctrine. Everybody needs to be dedicated to talking to others, to knowing doctrine, and to praying for more fruit. It's hard enough just, to, you know, for most ministers, if you have to preach twice a week, that's going to take up most of your time right there. And then you get counseling involved, too. So people need to get involved. All Christians should be knowledgeable and do things for Christ. Second, the believing Jews wanted Paul to stay, but he could not do to his desire to fulfill his vow. He must by all means keep the feast at Jerusalem. He had to keep the feast of Passover, or perhaps Pentecost. Scholars disagree which one it is. As noted, it is likely that he had to fulfill a vow made before his conversion or before he understood that the ceremonial law was set out of gear by Christ, although he understood it by this time. To the Jews, he remained as Jews. Moreover, a vow lawfully taken must be, uh, cannot be circumvented or dismissed. If you take a vow, and it's not an unlawful vow, you have to fulfill your vow. And then third, even though he told them he had to leave, he promised to return. I will return to you, God willing. The statement, God willing, should uh, condition all of our plans. And this is a common way for Paul and all the devout Jews to speak. In 1 Corinthians 4.19, Paul says, I will come to you shortly if the Lord wills. And we find similar uh, language in 1 Corinthians 16.7, Hebrews 6.3, James 4.13-15. And you can find it in the Old Testament as well. Here's what James 4, 13 to 15 says. Come now, you who say tomorrow, today or tomorrow, we shall go to such and such a city and spend a year there and buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or do that. And then fourth. Paul did go to Jerusalem before visiting Antioch and resuming his missionary labors, his third missionary journey. Verse 22 says, and we're going to end with this, and he landed at Caesarea and went up and greeted the church, and then he went down to Antioch. 
Caesarea was the international harbor for travelers to Jerusalem. <clears throat> In the Old Testament days, the main port was Joppa, which I believe was to the south. And people would go to Joppa. But Herod the Great greatly improved and built up the harbor at Caesarea using vast amounts of concrete. And it was one of the most impressive engineering feats of the ancient world. Once this port was completed, Joppa be ceased being a major port. And it was actually considered difficult and somewhat dangerous compared to Caesarea. So he goes to Caesarea, the main port, and then he goes to Jerusalem. Now it was at sea level, as are all harbors. The verb went up or gone up, the King James gone up, is exactly what someone would say if they were traveling to Jerusalem, which is at a higher level of elevation. Now we tend to say, I'm going to go up, if you're in LA, I'm going to go up to San Francisco. Or we'll say if you're in Philadelphia, I'm going to go up to New York, meaning I'm going to go north. But that's not the way Jews talk. They talked in terms of elevation. I'm going up to Jerusalem, it's at a higher elevation. And then from there, I'm going down to Antioch, even though Antioch is north, you're going down to Antioch, it's at a lower elevation. That's the way Jews spoke. So we have to keep that in mind as we look at this. Paul greeted the church at Jerusalem, met with the leadership, including Peter and James, if Peter was still there, Peter did some traveling, and he showed love and respect to the mother church. Now Luke is exceptionally brief in his account. We would expect Paul to give a full report about his missionary labors to the church, and it was from Jerusalem from which the gospel spread both to the diaspora and the Gentile areas. We know Pentecost, and then we know the, the splitting from the persecution. Jerusalem is about 65 miles southeast of Caesarea. The Nazarite vow, vow involved 30 days of purification, after which the Nazarite would present his shorn hair to God with a thank offering. And then after this, he went down to Antioch of Syria, some 300 miles to the north. What would he do? Well, he'd give a report of his labors, and he would minister to the church while he was there. He spent some weeks there. Some, uh, some believe he was there from the summer of 52 to the spring of 53. Ramsey thinks that the epistle of the Galatians was written during this period, right before he began his third missionary journey. It is generally acknowledged that the Judaizing party stirred up a doctrinal controversy over justification in Paul's absence, and we know that. We, well, we know that from, the, from Galatians, for one thing. And this brings us to an end of the second missionary journey. I know that's a lot of things to tie up at the end, but that's the way Acts is. It's just boom, 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 boom. He just Luke ties up all the, the loose ends so he can set up the third missionary journey. He wants you to know how Paul ended up at Antioch, ready to go on a third missionary journey, so he tells you. Well, just very briefly... What are some lessons from this last part of the narrative that we've looked at? We, are, we considered uh, other things earlier. What are, the, what are the lessons about this? Well, number one, we cannot fail to note the seriousness with which Paul regarded his vow to God. Now, a vow is a personal version of the covenant, of a covenant which is corporate. And, of course, Calvin in his commentary has a big thing in there on unlawful vows, how the Roman Catholics use this as a basis for all these uh, they would shave their heads and do all sorts of pagan things, and they would take vows. And Calvin, that's totally unscriptural. It's wrong, for example, to take a vow of celibacy. Now, if you have a call to that, uh, you don't need to take a vow to do that. But they had all these unbiblical vows, and Calvin condemns that, which I agree with him. But a lawful vow should be upheld, just as a lawful covenant must be upheld. The Bible teaches the binding nature of lawful vows and covenants, as do our Westminster Standards. Modern Presbyterians generally do not. Why? Why is that? Well, it's a sign of declension. Sad to say, it's a sign of declension. It's a sign of where modern Presbyterianism is. A covenant ties a church to its testimony and its corporate attainments. and says, we've achieved these great things, which is corporate sanctification, and we're not going to depart from them. It's a good thing. It's a very good thing, and it was very much a part of Presbyterianism in the First and Second Reformations. Now, if a church teaches doctrinal pluralism and has historically departed from many of the attainments of the Reformation, the OPC, the PCA, uh, 
even so-called conservative Presbyterians, and even the, the RPC and A to a, to a degree with their Christmas and all their uh, women's groups and feminism and all that garbage. Um, they must reject covenanting and testimony bearing. And the modern, the modern covenanters, the modern RPC and A does not believe in covenanting anymore. There's a few people who do, but most of them do not. They've rejected it because they're part of NAPARC, which is totally corrupt. Beloved, we must keep our covenant obligations to God and we must reject the widespread declension around us. Covenanting is a good thing if it's done lawfully. And it's basically to uphold the attainments of the Reformation. And the, 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 the RPCNA, which in the 1800s was called the RPCUS, were very good about this in the old days. We must never go from a more detailed uh, testimony or doctrinal statement to a less detailed and watered-down version of that. And they've done that. And why have they done that? Well, they're ecumenical with NAPARC and all these things. So that's one lesson. Number two, we should seek fellowship with other churches when possible. And that's what Paul did. As long as we are not required to water down our testimony or violate biblical principles. Now, having said that, it's very difficult today to do this uh, and that the defenders of declension and unbiblical ecumenicalism today treat those who strictly hold to the standards and covenants with contempt. They do. I know. I, that's the way I'm treated by the RPCNA, where they gossip and lie about me and say all, things, all sorts of things falsely against me. Um, but we should try to have fellowship as, as best we can. And if they reject you because you don't celebrate Christmas and you, you have hardcore uh, old you know, the old testimony, so be it. But we don't compromise in order to have fellowship. We seek fellowship, but we're not going to compromise to have it. And we'll end there, and then we'll come back, Lord willing, next week for the third missionary journey. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for this section of Scripture. We see your providential protection of Paul. Give us faith, Lord, that we would look to Christ to protect us when we're worried. That we would not have unlawful worry but that we would trust in Christ and his sovereign love and mercy toward us. So help us. Help us to be faithful to the covenants. When nobody else, uh, very few people believe in that. Help us, Lord, to be faithful. And help us to be uh, uh, solid in upholding the attainments of the Reformation, our testimony. In Jesus' name.